This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. On the show today, you'll find out where book publishing is going and how to take advantage of it. How to identify and avoid publishing predators. What opportunities are emerging as the book trade evolves in new forms. How to avoid losing money and much, much more. Join us now as a variety of publishing pros will deliver insights and strategies to take the author to the next, next level of publishing. It's your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. Brought to you by Author You and The Book Shepherd. And now, here's your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. Well, top of the publishing day to all of you. And as you know, on the Author You, your guide to book publishing podcast, which is now six years old, that we always try to bring you, not try, we do bring you tidbits, insights, ahas, how to's to further advance, to kickstart, to pull you out of the um, sometimes the valleys of not getting stuff done. So you move into becoming a published author. That's always our goal. With me today, uh, as you know, we sometimes we have fabulous guests. Sometimes I go solo. But with me is one of those people that would be the one you would want to be a partner. Um, he is a voice, one, the, the top voice on morning radio here in Colorado with the Dom and Jeremy show. He on and he is a best selling, award winning author's Hall of Fame inductee. Uh, and he's also someone who understands both the traditional publishing ups and downs and the indie publishing ups and downs. With me is Dom Testa. He is the author of, I'm just saying now a gazillion books, but what, <laughs> what I love about him is that uh, he doesn't need, seem to know what he wants to write under. He has five names. <clears throat> so depending upon, if you, if you like thrillers, you need to find the Eric Swan Thrillers series that is doing very well. Now he does put, you know, Dom Testa on the title of it so you can find him by author here so he's not incognito here but that but but he is snarky um and he's he's got a, a twist so if you as as dom says if you like james bond and a the quirkiness of deadpool you're gonna like eric swan dom welcome to the show well judith it's great to be here especially since you're the one who taught me so much about this business it's uh <laughs> It's an honor to be here. Thanks for letting me uh, chat with you. Yeah. So you, you know, it's like when I, uh, Dom, years back in 1979, I paid someone <clears throat> $7,500 to show me how to start writing. $7,500. So that's 30 k today because I knew nothing. I knew nowhere to start. I had no idea what would be a reasonable amount. I knew nothing, nothing, nothing. And the great news is I knew nothing. So I was willing to learn. And, and I learned. And doing that. So I always believed in paying it forward. I've always believed in that, although a lot of people don't pay to get it going forward. But I just believe that it's good karma to keep it moving, as we say. So, yeah, yeah Dom, Dom and I got to play two weeks ago um, at, in uh, September in Colorado, where he is this fabulous MC for the Authors Hall of Fame. One, one of my favorite pictures, Dom, is the one where you looked in the bag that Penny Hamilton brought up, trying to figure out, that is such a hoot. She's a character. But, you know, so this interesting thing about that night was it was such a diverse um, mm -hmm. lineup of authors, not mm -hmm. just in genre, but in personalities. Mm -hmm. And in a way, that's kind of a microcosm of probably all the writers that you've dealt with through the years is you've mm -hmm. got introverts, you've got extroverts, you've got people who write, you know, very serious things. You've got people who have a touch of humor to them. It really covers a, a wide spectrum. And that's one of the things that I love about that hall of fame uh, gala is that you get so many different flavors of author. Oh, and, and they were there. And I, and I have to tell all of you, it was so much fun to see over 200 people all dressed to the nines. Yeah. 
All dressed to the nines. When's the last time you've seen that, Dom? <laughs> well, you know, especially <laughs> given COVID, there's. Uh, I think a yeah. lot of people probably were shocked to find out that their, <laughs> you know, their Sunday go to meet and clothes just didn't fit as well anymore. <laughs> I had so. someone told me he went and bought a new suit. So. <laughs> yeah. And that's true. But, you know, one of the nicest things about the event, and then we're going to jump into where is indie publishing going and all those other things, is that um, one of the guests who attended, he wrote me the next morning, he said, I don't know how many countless months have gone by that I've been in a room where I felt so much calm, so much peace, so much positive energy, and people surrounded by people who do what they love. Yeah. And I thought that was what was really cool. Yeah. Well, you know, and let me piggyback on that. One of the things that I try to tell people who are getting into the business is that the author community um, is a very supportive community. There are so many different industries that's cutthroat and people trying to, uh, you know, drag their competitors down. And with independent publishing, especially, it's not a zero sum game. It's it's like we're, we're kind of, you know, the rising tide lifting all boats, I think. That's one of the the beauties of independent publishing is that it's such a supportive community. And when you do go to a gathering like that or maybe a meeting for Author You or, you know, one of the conferences that you put on, it feels very supportive because people aren't trying to, you know, climb above everybody else. Everybody shares information. Everybody shares knowledge. And that helps all authors, I believe. Well, yeah, I, th I think one of the things where everyone is so um, no holds barred supportive is because there is such an eclectic mix of people and books and genres. I mean, the subset of all the genres is stunning, stunning. So you may pick up a heck of an idea from someone who writes spicy romance and you're a sci-fi writer just because of something they said that you now can take and run with it. And, mm -hmm. and so that's what I love. You know, that's one of the things I truly, truly love. All right, so Dom, you've been on the radio since you were a kiddo, since you were a teen. Um, were you writing then? Well, I was, but I think like a lot of teenagers, I had no real direction with writing. I knew that I liked doing it. I, I, I grew up as a military brat. So we moved every couple of years, which means, you know, you have to make new friends every couple of years. Mm -hmm. And so the only real constant in my life was the library. So like a lot of military brats, I think I read more than the average kid out there. And when you read that much, eventually you get to the point where you think you can do it. And so we start jotting down our stories, I think, as young people. And I never really thought at that age that I might do something with it in terms of trying to get published um, until a, a high school teacher of mine was extremely supportive. You know, it's interesting as you and I record this, it's a uh, world teacher day. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. most of us can probably point out one teacher who really mm -hmm. had an impact. And for me, it was Sherilyn Hanks. And she said, you know, you're, you're pretty good at this. This is something that you should pursue. Um, and that was the first time I ever really gave it any serious thought. Yeah. Mm. And see, mine was Mrs. Russell. There you go. I, Mrs. Ru in fact, Mrs. Russell grilled into me to avoid using the words always and never. <laughs> yeah. It, and, it, and look at this. All these years later, you remember that. You don't forget it, right? Oh, no, I haven't forgot it because, mm. because you're going to eat them. Oh, I'll never do that. Oh, yeah, you will. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And then there's always these, you know, people. And then it was the teachers who noticed me from, from my writing. I got in trouble because I passed notes all the time. And I just didn't know that was going to be my, you know, vocation. <laughs> that sounds like you. That sounds just like you, actually, being a note sharer. I was. I passed. I started passing notes in second grade to everybody. Anybody in, you know, second grade, I was six years old. I was passing notes to everybody in the world. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So that, you know, a lot of us didn't think we were going to be writers, I think, when we started out. In fact, I didn't know that there was a vocation as writing. I just didn't mm. dawn on me that you got paid for this stuff. Yeah, I I think I, I, I recognized it by the time I was in high school. But, you know, I think 
so many beginning writers um, have that fear that, you know, I'm not good enough to do it. What do they call it? Imposter syndrome, right? That if we if we write something that we're some sort of fraud or imposter and we're not good enough to get it out there. And so I think I speak for a lot of people who are mm -hmm. who were closet writers. I was where I wrote for years and years and I just would print my stories up after I finished writing them and put them in a folder in a drawer and never do anything with them. And, and that's too bad. And we're fortunate now that we live in a time where, um, you know, you don't require the gatekeepers that you used to have to go through to get published. You know, traditionally it was very, very difficult. And now we live in a time where, you know, just about anybody can, can publish almost anything. Although mm -hmm. in a way, and, and we could talk more about that in some ways that's good. And in some ways that's bad, right? Like mm -hmm. I've heard somebody mm -hmm. say, you know, the good news is anybody can publish a book and the bad news is anybody can publish a book. Mm -hmm. And my add to that is that when you look at the, the data is well over 80 percent of the population says they have a, a book in them. And I always add, but should it be allowed out? <laughs> so, right. so, yeah. so, so, so and that is the good news and the bad news. And and when we um, when we come back. Um, after this first break, I would love to get in with you because you have you started as a self-publisher where it was called self-publishing. I mean, you probably didn't really think of indie. I'm an independent publisher. I was a mm -hmm. self-publisher. Um, and then you went big time with New York. And now here you are. You're back joining us again. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, got dragged so, back into the indie world. Dragged back in. And so as we go to this, this this first break, I just want you all to know that the indie world is outselling the number of books as well as representing authors than traditional publish today. This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these. Is there a book in you? Or another? Author You shows you how to create, develop, and publish your book without being hoodwinked. If you already have a book out, you will find a supportive and brainstorming community that is connected and creative, no matter where you live. Author U brings in national experts for its book camps and annual Author U extravaganza. It has regular meetings and delivers webinars for its members on timely topics. Through Author U's extensive network, members enjoy exclusive benefits, including significant discounts for a variety of services necessary to publishing. Author U is the premier authoring resource in the country, creating community, education, guidance, vision, and success for the serious author. If you want to create a book that has pizzazz, punch, and panache, Author U is for you. Timely author and publishing tips and articles are posted on its social media platforms, and it is free. Discover Author U, where authors go to become seriously successful. Join Author U today at AuthorU.org. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. If you want to write and publish a book, if you want to be successful as an author, your guide to book publishing, everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask, is for you. Stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. With me is Dom Testa, and his latest book series is the Eric Swan, S-W-A-N, 
thrillers, and you will find them under Dom's name, um, like instead of hiding under one of the other many names he uses. <laughs> but And he also has a great book called um, The Color of Your Dreams, which is really for the author writer who's just not sure of where they're going, what they're doing, maybe a little fearful, and just a really, a really good Kickstarter goose. So I'd recommend that book to you always available on Amazon, or you can go to your favorite bookstore and ask for them. And if they don't have them, tell them to order them. It's my thought. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, I always do that. All right. So Dom, um, I wanted to, I wanted to get into the indie um, and you really started your, uh, in the self and you started as a self published author with your YA series. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. I used to do a lot of school visits um, mm -hmm. helping kids kind of discover their own creative spark. And I wouldn't necessarily call them writing workshops, but they were, I guess, children forms of, of writing workshops. And I had so many teachers say, well, have you written something for kids? And I said, well, no, but it gave me the idea. So I sat down and crafted a, a story. It was my first, uh, eventually ended up being the first published work I had. It was about a 65,000 word young adult science fiction novel. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think of it as being the first in a series until I was about halfway through and realized it could be more than that. And I wanted to get it out in a hurry. Judith is the thing. I knew that I could probably try to find an agent, go through mm -hmm. that whole process. But, you know, as people find out, that is that is a years, plural, long, you know, commitment to yes. finding the agent, getting it. Yep you know, submitted, uh, getting then once, if you do come to terms with someone, it takes another year to two years before the book ever comes out. I wanted my book out right away. So I just went to, uh, I went to work on learning things like InDesign, the, the software system. I found a, a cover artist overseas, actually. He lives in England. And I started putting it all together. This was the early 2000s before the big, you know, what they call the golden age of indie publishing, but this was 2001, 2002. And I went ahead and put the first book out and it, uh, it, it did pretty well. It won some awards. I put out a second. And then as I was putting out the third, I was happen. I, I just happened to have a, a beer one time with a good friend of mine named Judith Bryles. Hey, that's you. <laughs> and Judith says, you really, really need to, if you're, if you're, trying to get this thing out there to a mass audience, really, at the time. She said, why don't you talk to a buddy of mine who's an agent? Uh, and uh, we ended up connecting. And the next thing you know, it was um, um, a six-book deal with Tor uh, McMillan in New York for the series. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so I've done the, the indie publishing. I've done traditional, and now I'm back doing indie again. So I am technically what's known as a hybrid author. I think there's plenty of us. Yeah, You're a hybrid I, author. So. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And and people ask me, would I go back to New York? And and my line is from John Grisham. And I said, I would consider working with New York again if they offered me so much money, I don't care what they do with it. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, that is directly from John Grisham's lips. So I, I think that what we have to do, that there are really reasons and we can go through some of the indie plus. But but I will say this, that when you did that leap with those three first three books at then and you had these others, you know, all ready to go. So they picked the whole enchilada up, Tor did, is that it took your books visually, commercially to another level. Um, to me, when I see them, when I see the evolution where your old, your original uh, covers, they all look self-published to me. When yep. I looked at what Tor brought to the game, mm -mm -mm -mm, we're in another game here. Now, yep. what's what's really fun, though, and this is this is the power of being in an author community, everybody, is that when you start seeing, you know what, you can match what New York does. There, Those people are available to you that can create the quality and the imagination and creativity of those upper end covers. They're there. They're, they're there. You just have to hang out and find out where they are. And yeah, that, I that's agree. what it brings. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was a good lesson to working with New York for so many years because 
you learn that side of the business and mm -hmm. it's, you can't get too much information. I mean, sometimes it's like the proverbial, you know, drinking from a fire hose kind of thing. Um, but you can't get too much information. I think people get overwhelmed and they think they've got to learn it all overnight. And that's not the case. I mean, you can mm -hmm. kind of take your time, but the, but the more you learn about not just the craft of writing, but the business side of writing, um, the better. I mean, it'll pay off for you down the road. And, and some people, you know this, some people throw their hands up and they're like, oh, I just want to write. I don't want to learn that other stuff. And the response to that has to be, well, then you're just going to sell five copies to your family and friends. Uh, if you don't want to learn the business of the business, then you're pretty much going to be lost. Well, it, it lost and you may not be found unless you dig yourself out. And yeah. that we've seen that. I mean, the average self-published books, if they go without learning this business side is 100 sales. That's it. That's where it stops. And and that's where you've hit all the low hanging fruit. That's the family, the friends, the next door neighbor, the local craft fair <laughs> and the church. That's where it's it's that's where it's done. And so you really have to learn it. And I know that when I stepped away, I stepped away from New York in 2000. And it happened when one of my clients wanted a thousand copies of my books and I had just taken the rights back and I had to figure out this layout business. And I knew I wasn't going to do it. I wasn't going to do what you did, Dom, and go to InDesign. Uh, no, I'm not. In fact, it was only Quark then. I wasn't going to do that. Um, I was, you know, I would find someone to do it. And I found someone who actually laid out one of my books for one of the pub New York publishers, Josie Bass. So, I, and she was right here in Boulder. So that's, oh, wow. that's where I started. And then finding the cover and the only screw up I did is I knew, and this is what you have to learn. You have got to learn this printing side, what the printing options are, because now that you've got print on demand, which of course, Dom, when you and I started print on demand, wasn't an op wasn't even existing at that time. Um, on that, but you can very quickly know when I told someone quotes me a book price and they're, they're being charged like 12 or $13 a book. And I can go in and figure out that book costs $4 on POD. You've got a problem and you need to go back and talk to whoever is publishing your books, yeah. <laughs> but that's learning the business side. And neither one of us would have done that unless we actually jumped in with our feet. Yeah, and it can be intimidating and scary, but you also have, like we were talking a few minutes ago about the this how supportive the community is. You can you can definitely find people, and there there are, you know besides author you, there are other online sites. There are a lot of Facebook mm -hmm. groups to help, you know, beginning authors. And I, I I just encourage people to to immerse themselves in in those worlds. And let's, you know, we'll do a caveat here. There's a lot of crappy information that's out there too. But if you spend enough time, you'll, you know, the cream does rise to the top in terms of information and suggestions and recommendations. And, and if you put in the effort, um, you'll be glad you did because there's a lot of, there's a lot of great sources out there today. And, you know, you were talking about, you know, not wanting to learn InDesign and stuff like that. That's another area where we're very fortunate today is there's so much powerful software that can help an author today. I was just talking to somebody the other day that there's there's essentially three programs that are crucial to my business. And it's three different little software programs. Mm. And without those, uh, I mean, it would be like 20 years ago trying to learn to do everything myself. But you just pick up a handful of little pieces of software and it makes all the difference in the world. All right, so you you dangled those, Dom. Are you going to share? Well, okay. I mean, I you know, I it's they're free plugs for software that I have no connection to. Um, right. One is Scrivener. I'm a Scrivener writer, mm -hmm. um, and I know some people like it and some people don't. That's fine. I love it. The other one that's huge for me is Vellum, in terms of laying out the design of both your ebook and your print book. Um, it has made it so easy um and and just like in a flash i mean you can upload your your files and you know within a few seconds it'll spit out an ebook for you um and then the third one that i use a lot for marketing is canva 
-hmm. because you can design, you know, great ads for your books. If you want to put your ads on um, social media or something like that, or if you want to um, create other types of marketing materials, uh, I find Canva to be a godsend. So okay. let me give you a fourth tool you might want to discover, and it's called Book Brush. And yeah, I'm familiar with that. All right, Book Brush takes Canva to another level, and it's designed exclusively for authors. And they mm -hmm. have a whole free version like Canva. Canva also has a fee version. Um, it has a whole free version, but there's other windows can open it in other levels. And in the platinum level now, which is, you know, like a hundred and something, it's, it's minor a year, but um, that it will make book trailers for you, which is yeah. hot, hotsy totsy. So if anyone's interested in that, and, I, you know, Dom said he doesn't get anything, I don't get anything either. But if you decide you want to buy something, if you use my name, Judith, and the number 15, that just it gives you a 15% discount. I get zero for that. Zero. All I did was negotiate a discount for you on the price. So Super cool. Yeah, I've heard about it. I have not used it yet, but I've heard nothing but great things. So I'll definitely it. check it out. It, it is worth playing with. I've done webinars with them. And um, it's it's when I'm seeing now the difference between the posters that are getting created on Canva and what we do on BookBrush. BookBrush is a level up. So this, just saying everybody, um, but this is what the author community does here. Dom and I are talking, I'm hearing about, you know, I'm familiar with all his little goodies, um, but I was also able to share something he knew about, but hadn't actually used. So it sounds like. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's really, really what you want to do. All right. We have a minute to our next break, but Dom, here's what I got sidetracked. So you started, you went in. Um, I remember because uh, you gave me the name of Larry Yoder um, at the bookies and the bookies, of yeah. course, was uh, well presented at the Authors Hall of Fame, as well as Larry Yoder came with his own fan club. And right. <laughs> True. It was like the Oscar. The Oscars announced that everyone came up and brought Larry with them because he was so influential. So when we come back from our break, let's talk about uh, let's open up what bookstores a little bit can do. And then I want to do I definitely do want to get into what's evolving in the indie market and why authors should be taking a peek of it or, you know, what caution steps they need to have in play. Because I think that's important, too. All right, everyone, we'll be right back with me as the fabulous, amazing Dom Testa. And you're listening to Author You, your guide to book publishing. This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask with your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these. Discover the power of you and your book at the Judith Bryles Unplugged events. Each summer, Judith Bryles Book Marketing Unplugged unfolds over three intensive days working with just Judith. You get publishing strategies, author and book platforms, book marketing panache and pizzazz, and authoring tools to take you and your book to rock star success. In the fall and winter, Judith Bryles Speaking Unplugged includes Judith as your coach and mentor during two powerful days. You will learn how to structure a speech, how to create openings and closings, how to find gigs that pay you and sell your books, and you will get one-on-one -on -one coaching. Go to thebookshepherd.com and click on the Events tab to learn how to participate at the next Unplugged Workshop event. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. Coming up, you'll hear more about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. Just 
Dom Test is with me. He's the author of the Eric Swan Thrillers series. And we all love series because once you fall in love with an author, you don't want them to be a one book pony. Um, and a wonderful book just for authors, authors at all levels called Color of Your Dreams. And um, we're just talking about a variety of things. I want to come back to your experience with New York before I forget about this. And did you come away with any big takeaways that that really dropped and became game changers for you, Dom? Well, it's going to sound like I'm dogging my publisher, and I'm not, because I have nothing but wonderful things to say about them. They were the kindest people. Uh, you know, they, I was essentially a rookie at the time, and they took me under their wing. But but what I did learn is that if you are not Stephen King or John Gris, Grisham or James Patterson or somebody like that, um, you're not going to get – uh, as much in the way of support that you might think. Like, I th you know, we all have this dream that, hey, if I get signed by a major publisher, oh my God, then I'm a million selling author and Hollywood's going to keep, you know, calling me. And, and that's not the case. I mean, you still have to do essentially all the work yourself in terms of getting your book noticed and out there. And that was a, that was quite the eye opener for me because I assumed when they said, hey, we're signing you to a six book deal, I was like, that's it. You know, I'm on easy street and it's not the case. And it's one of the reasons why if you're going to do independent publishing, to me, you're you're maybe not doing um, as much work when you're with a traditional publisher, but you're doing enough so that it doesn't justify the difference in what you get paid from a traditional publisher versus what you make as an independent publisher, if that makes sense. It's, you have to do so much more work that you might as well just be publishing it yourself and taking the lion's share of the royalties. I, I think you would agree with that. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, you know, I, I can nail down very quickly what people are gonna make. Most, most of these books that are coming out from New York are gonna be in the paper format versus a case bound or hardcover. Deal. And if that's the case, if if you, all of you dear authors, if you sell what is traditionally being sold, and I don't know if you, the, you know these numbers, but right now the traditional mid-list type book, Dom, sells 5,000 copies in its life cycle with a mm -hmm. published deal. So that means you're going to make at the royalty base for under 5,000 with a New York publisher, you're going to make anywhere from 47 cents up to about 70 cents a book. That is not very much money. That's chicken feed when you think of all the work you do in. Plus with New York is that the rules changed. The rules changed about in 2000 with Simon & Schuster when they said they altered all our contracts because I was with Simon at that time. Um, altered all our contracts from uh, the, you got your royalty on the gross retail price. Did you know that Dom? Back yeah, then? I remember okay. going through the fine, you know, print yep. on my contract. Yep. And it was pretty eye opening. Yeah. And then they went to net. OK, yeah. so a -choom! and that's where it all really changed the drop. And that's when I made the decision, besides with this thousand book order, that uh, it was time for me to learn the trade and jump ship, which is what I did do. And that when you start looking at that work you do, besides you're the, you're the creator of the product, you're the inventor of the product, and New York does all the design and they do all that kind of stuff. A lot of times New York really doesn't want your opinion and really care that much about your opinion. I don't know how much they came back to you and got your input as they were doing new layouts and cover designs, Dom. Did they want you part to partner with them on that? No, not really. And again, I'm not knocking them. I think they're no. just a little bit uh, exasperated that, you know, I would ask to change little mm -hmm. things on the cover, but they were big to me. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, I, listen, there's some people who are going to hear this podcast and they're going to say, yeah, but I don't want to have to do cover design and I don't want to have to do this. And I, well, then that's great. But just know that you are giving up a lot of the creative side of your creation. And so you just have to weigh those pros and cons, you know, how much do you want to be in control of your product versus how much do you want to get paid for each copy that sells? So mm -hmm. 
it's a decision to be made. And you know, there's no wrong answer. I think, you know, if some people were born to be traditionally published because that's they just want to sit in a room and they just want to write. Mm-hmm. But I'm telling you, if you don't want to do any kind of marketing or promotion for your work, um, you better hope that you get the old, what's the old cliche lightning in a bottle, you know, with, with your book, because otherwise it's just going to flounder. It will. And New York's pub, one of the things that also changed and it's really dramatic now is New York's expectation is that if you get an advance of which a lot of those advances have come way down is that you will be putting that all that into marketing because you're going to be doing it. Mm-hmm. And, and that's the that's the I think that's probably the biggest um, shocker for authors to realize, well, I'm going to be marketing my book, too. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. that's that's the wake up for me. That's yeah. the wake up. And and I I'm a control freak. I really want to like my cover. And those little things are big things to me, me too. And I and I want that book cover to really be marketing oriented, of which I see most books that come out of New York are not marketing oriented. Yeah, I just was after they put out six books for me um, it, about 14 years later, I, I just got the rights back to that series. Mm-hmm. And so I'm I'm republishing it. I'm relaunching it and, you know, all new covers. And it's it's kind of an exciting time because. Mm-hmm. Although, you know, I wrote that first book 20 years ago, mm-hmm. um, it's it's all kind of fresh and new again, and it gets a like a new coat of paint on it. And I I'm excited about that. Um, it's added a lot of work for me this year because, you know, I that six novels dumped into my lap and I've got to you know start doing some you know refresh edits on it and the cover design and the layout and, you know, any kind of marketing. And, you know, am I going to do audio books for these and. It adds a, a lot more work, but it was very exciting to get that email that said, yeah, all right, well, you know, you can have rights reversion. I, th- I mean, I threw a party that day. I mean, it was it was huge. Yeah, yeah. I, I would have come to your party. I didn't hear about it. <laughs> well, geez. Um, I, I think that it, it is makeovers are wonderful sometimes. And and you do. There isn't an author out there that I know of that doesn't look at their book a decade later and think, oh, my God, why did I write it this way? Or, yes. that, boy, this really needs a different twist and and that. So having a book, having a makeover possibility and a, and a new launch and a new uh, lifeline is wonderful. And my advice to you is do you when you uh, throughout do I do an audio book? Uh, yeah, you do. Yep. Well, I've done audio books of everything else. It's just suddenly I've got these six books dumped and I realize what a um, you know, what an investment that is because the, the, the voice company that I use and the guy that I use, I mean, he's terrific, but that's quite a, an upfront investment. Uh, let me put it this way. There will be audio books on this series, but I just, I don't think there will be in the next six months. So well, maybe they're you coming. Could- Let's talk on the side about negotiating, partnering with them so you don't have so much up front. Yeah, we, you know, I know about that, and I, I'm not crazy about that idea because I'm like you. I'm the control freak, and I don't want to do um, you know, a royalty split with the voice people. I prefer just to pay them um, because I tend to think in a very optimistic way that these are going to be a hit, and – I don't want to split the royalties <laughs> with anybody. Okay. Just, it might be it might be my days of working with a traditional publisher where they got, you know, so much yeah. from from my work and so now I'm a little bit gun shy to get back into that. So well, you remember you don't have to split always. There are negotiation factors. Yeah. Let yeah. me ask you something. When you yeah. do your audiobooks, do you yeah. do yours wide or do you just work purely with Audible? No, I go wide. Okay. I go wide. Or you may or you may go with uh, that's a great question. Everybody when he says do you go wide, that means non-exclusive with Audible. Mm-hmm. Um and of course Audible is the gorilla. It's owned by Amazon. But you could do a one year with Audible to try to really get it down. And then, you know, there's places like Faraway Books and others that really do um their their communication is a lot clearer. Yeah. Uh, th- that's been my experience. So I will do uh, a one shot, and then I pull it off because it used to be Audible. They owned you for seven years. It's like, yeah. yikes! 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> no one owns me for seven years. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm rethinking a lot of the whole um, exclusivity, uh, yeah, yeah. regardless of the format, because even with that Eric Swan thriller series, that has been exclusive to Kindle Unlimited since it first came out about a year and a half ago. Uh And starting in just a few weeks from now, from when we're recording this, it will be going wide onto all the other platforms, you know, Apple and Kobo and Barnes and Noble and places like that. So that's an interesting debate, you know, that sometime we can get into as well. And I don't know how much you donate your podcast to talking about the pros and cons of being exclusive versus being wide, but I'm I'm shifting towards wide all of a sudden. You know, I've never had a dedicated show to that, but I, you know, I think that you got number one. You have to be on Amazon. I mean, to people who still poo-poo Amazon, look at if Amazon hadn't come up, I guess someone else would. But if Amazon hadn't come up, the whole self-publishing market would have had no portals. Yeah. To go out. I mean, it has done. It certainly got its share of hiccups, but um, I, overall. It has done immense, immense pluses for the independent market and moving it out. And that's not to leave. Dom did mention um, that he has a wonderful story about a a small independent bookstore here in Denver where the owner bought six copies of his books. Um, And he ended up crying because he just couldn't (laughs) believe my book was accepted. And he walked away with cash in hand and (laughs) <laughs> and so it's you do need to know who you, who's in your community that can help you. But there's so many ways. I mean, Dom, I have one of my clients sold 10,000 copies of her books between the months of May and September over a three year period, just showing up at little craft shows oh, in, wow. the, in the community. Um, and that's how she did it. There's just so much you can do. But that's where the author community comes in hand to help you out um, in that. So, and here we are, Dom, Dom and I have been talking, we're up to our final break, but so, Dom, we have got to come back to what's the prognosis on the independent market? Where is it going? What do you see? You've now rejoined it again. We're so glad to have you back. Um, <laughs> and and some of the hiccups, um, and that one of the hiccups with being with New York is you're not in control. I learned that very quick. They didn't care about my opinion. <laughs> and I'm just thinking, but I'm the author. You know, I, so um, they have their own ideas and that's where you've got to figure out if the Jennifer of the month in the publicity department is actually someone who reads your genre. And if she's doing your whole <laughs> and, and, if she, <laughs> and if she's doing your whole marketing plan to someone that you don't even write for. Oh, oh, all right. We'll be right back. This is your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. And we'll be right back with more great information right after these. Are you confused about publishing options? Do you know which printing option is best for your book? Does your stomach flip when you think about selling books? Or do you feel overwhelmed with what to do about book marketing and publicity? Get the answers and much more. Get them and from someone who knows publishing inside and out from both the traditional and independent sides how to make a successful book. You can't do it alone without paying the price. You can spend your money creating a book that turns out to be so-so. Or you can create a book that looks and feels classy, builds your brand and platform, and is a success, a bestseller. It is your choice. You choose. If you want author and publishing success, you want Judith Bryles as your book coach. Sign up for her weekly blogs and easing at thebookshepherd.com. The book shepherding concept is simple. The publishing world is changing, and so must you. You need an experienced shepherd and guide to collaborate with you as you create, strategize, develop, 
publish and achieve your publishing goals. Publishing is riddled with obstacles, sometimes nightmares for the author. You do not need more problems. You want solutions. Dr. Judith Riles will shepherd you through the maze and chaos. At times, she has had to step in and rescue a book. A book that has been sabotaged by a publisher, by a publishing service provider, and sometimes even by the author. If you want author and book success, connect with her today at thebookshepherd.com. Welcome back to your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. If you want to write and publish a book. If you want to be successful as an author, your guide to book publishing, everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask, is for you. Stay tuned and you'll hear about statistics, scenarios, and strategies on what to do now to get you published. So let's get back to the show. And here again is your host, Dr. Judith Bryles. With me today is Dom Testa, one of my favorite people in the world. I just kind of wish he hadn't moved out of Denver. Um, <laughs> and, and I still have your recipe for one of your dinners that you love, Dom, and I we kick it up. <laughs> so we're having dinner with Dom tonight. Um, and that Dom's a broadcaster. Um, Dom, tell him a little bit about your morning show for people who could tune into it. Uh, I've been doing the morning show on Mix 100 in Denver since 1993. Um, I, I started hosting that show the week after Bill Clinton was first inaugurated. Wow. So, you know how long ago that was. Wow. And yeah, coming up on 29 years here in just a few months. And, uh, yeah, you, you know, if people are listening to your podcast anywhere in the world, they can listen to the morning show anywhere in the world. They just have to look for, uh, mix 100 Denver on their app store on their phone. It's a free app. They can download it. Mix 100 Denver and, uh, they can listen anywhere. Yeah, and, and sometimes, everyone, it is so knocked down funny, you're either going to become incontinent or you're going to have to just pull off the road if you're listening in the car and just listen for a while. Well, that's right. very kind of you. I work with a very <laughs> funny guy named Jeremy. He is super talented. So we have a good time every morning. Yeah, which is a great way to start off the morning. All right, so um, that one of the things that let, let's kiss on before we go, we I want to do the wrap up with with what's going on with Indy, but let's kiss on fear and doubt a little bit because all authors have the fear. I mean, I, I've had people saying when I'm looking and they brought in a 100,000 word book and I read the first three chapters, I've got a feeling of their writing, I know where it's go, I know what level of editing it's gonna need, et cetera. And they are appalled that I can make that decision just reading a couple of chapters because they're so fearful. There's such doubt. Yeah. And I, you know, there's, I, you and I both hear from people all the time, you know, Hey, I want to write a book. I want to write a book. I want to write a book. And that's, you know, why don't you? It's like, well, I don't think I'm good enough or, well, I've written the first chapter a hundred times, but I can't, you know, I can't get any farther than that. And I know that that kind of breaks my heart because even people who've put out you know, 20 or 50 books still have that doubt, but at least they push through it. Um, and, and I, and I just always felt bad that, that people were being held back by those fears like, Oh, I'm not good enough. Or look, even the people who are best selling authors today, they grew up reading books by people that they idolized and they thought, Oh, I'm not as good as them. So I put together, I wrote a nonfiction book just a couple of years ago called the color of your dreams uh, stolen from a line by John Lennon in one of his songs. And the whole idea is not to teach people how to write. It is not a book on craft. It won't tell you how to write a book. But what it does is it helps you get through the mental blocks that you have because we all stumble over those. Um, I think fear and doubt are the two number one things that hold people back from finally publishing a book. And, and so that's why I wanted to put that out a few years ago. I, I, I think it's a, it's a crucial problem for a lot of would-be writers. Well, we all we all have stumbles um, on that, and I hear that all the time. That, that I, I always talk about the vulnerability factor, and one of the factors which goes along, it really right is up there with the fear and doubt that when you do finally publish, you open up the vulnerability window, 
And people will say things that are also stunningly wonderful and sometimes stunningly awful. Have you ever had that experience, Dom? Yeah, I have. Because, you know, even the the people who have never written anything feel mm. sometimes like they're an expert on, <laughs> yes, on exactly. everything. And, and you know, it's it's like the whole one-star review, too, that people are, are afraid of that. Like, oh, I'm afraid, you know, what if people give me a bad review? Well, here's what I like to point out to people. Go on to Amazon today and pull up a book like uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, all right? And look at the number of one-star reviews. And if anything, that should boost your spirits a little bit to know that those one star people are out there and it doesn't even matter how good of a job you do writing your book. There are just trolls out there who oftentimes are frustrated writers and they are going to rip everything. So that actually should make you feel better. It's like, pff, God, if, if, you know, Harper Lee got one star reviews, uh, I'm going to go for it. Because you're writing for the people who like what you do. You're not worried about the people who are going to bring you down. You're writing for the people who will appreciate what you have to say. And that's all you have to keep in mind. Don't even read the snarky, gnarly reviews because those are just sad, angry people. That's, that's, those are the people who write one-star reviews of books. They're just sad people, in my opinion. So. Well, I, I agree. They're trolls, sad and angry. And here's the other thing that I've discovered. People who get snarky or really critical are often really envious because you wrote the book and they didn't. I'm sure that's true. Yeah. And and when I finally embraced that, um, it just said, you know, well, twit to you. <laughs> mm-hmm. And and let it go. So it's, it's, that's really important. All right. So let's talk about where is indie going? I mean, you've seen an evolution, haven't you? Well, and in revolution. Yeah. It's interesting because now we have what 1.5 is they say it's 1.5 million mm-hmm. books a year that are now published, something like that. Yeah. You know, and anybody can do it. And like we said earlier, that's good news and bad news. Mm-hmm. But the only concern I have about that is the rush to put out work that's not ready to go out yet. Yep. While I encourage people to get that book out of them and work on it and publish it, I don't encourage people to vomit it out in about two days and have it online on sale two days after that. I constantly hear people say, oh, I'm writing 15,000 words a day. I write a novel every five days and I put out 36 novels last year. I have to be the person who raises his hand and says, you know, yeah, good for you that you vomited out a whole bunch of stuff, but there's, it's just not possible to publish a book every five days and think that they're going to be of significant quality. I, some people will disagree with me. I get that, but I just think that it, I wouldn't be all fired up to put out a book a week. I think that's, Mm -mm. Mm -mm. I think that's not the right move because what that does then is it brings down in people's minds, the quality of all independent publishing, right? If we have enough indie publishing that is garbage, then suddenly it's going to go back to the way it was 15, 20 years ago when you, you know, had newspaper editors who all said, well, I'm not going to, you know, uh, say anything about indie books because all indie books are garbage. Well, we all know there are a lot of indie books that are some of the best books written, period. Mm-hmm. But if they're surrounded with a million books that people just threw out without any you know, thought put into it, without you know, uh, any real, I don't know, dedication and intention of making it the best book you can make it. I think that hurts everybody. So I would encourage people, put out your book, but put in enough time that you feel you've given it your very best shot. Well, and and add to that, if you're vomiting a book every week or even two books a month, because they're out there too, is that unless you have a machine behind you to promote them, all they're doing is polluting because you're not putting any care into nurturing them, to teaching them to walk, to grow up, to building a fan base for people who are looking for the next book that comes 
you know, out of your your house, so to speak. Um, and that's been that's really my experience, because that, you know, when you're looking at that one point six million books that are being published every year that have that has an ISBN, th- there's a lot that don't even have an ISBN, Dom, that are not yeah. being counted in this number. So, you know, I going back to what I said at, at the beginning of the show, you know, should your book be allowed route? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, and I think and that's true. And it's not a contradictory statement. I mean, because I do encourage people to get their book out, but I just just you know, there's a lot there's a um, a lot of resources to help you make your book the best it can be and everyone should have it's like pride of ownership in your home. You should have pride of ownership in your work. Don't be so in a hurry to publish it that you don't put out your best work. And Judith and Author You and a bunch of other organizations can help you make it the best that it could be. Well, I love that. And, you know, I'm one of those that when I, I'm a binge writer, although I write every day. And I think one of the tips for all of you is you should be writing every day. It doesn't mean that you're writing on your book. You could be writing a blog. You could be writing notes to people. But I think that that fluidity of writing is really important. I, think I agree. It's just really important. Yeah. And, and, and I've, don't write on my, I'm working on a new book. I don't write on it every day. I think sometimes I'm thinking about it. I may make some notes and tuck them aside, but I'm always, there is not a day that goes by every week that I am not doing some kind of writing that requires some creativity in it. It's a great, and, that's a great piece of advice. Yeah. It's just, it's just really essential. And I might throw another one is that I think it's really important to exercise what your hand can do in the writing that there's, there is just, there's a connection when you move that hand with your heart, your head and all that. It's, it's, um, I mean, I, I remember reading, I can't remember the name of Tom Hanks book, but I discovered he has over 300 typewriters. And he collects typewriters and he likes the click of a typewriter. And so, I That's mean, funny. I did not know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and so sometimes, you know, that manual, do you remember when, when you took a typing class, right, Dom? You bet. All right. So we did the quick round fox, jumped over the fence, right? And, and we did that. But there was that, you know, that mechanical that you, because you were moving your arm you were focused and concentrated in it. I think we've lost some of that. And with that, we're at the end of the show. Dom, any other tip you might want to add in these last few seconds? Oh, uh, Besides writing every day, read every day. Because I think the uh, best writers yes. are people who read all the time. So. Absolutely. Uh, that's an amen. And if you're not reading in your genre of what your competitors are doing, you're making a mistake. You need to stay current, people. Thanks for the time today, Judith. You're welcome. Dom Testa, thank you for being with us. And author you, your guide to book publishing. We'll see you next week. Thank you for being a part of your guide to book publishing. Everything you want to know but didn't know what to ask. With your host, Dr. Judith Bryles.